which leads me to a question I wanted to ask you, which is, as I'm sure all, all of the crowd knows, you were very much singled out for uh, your role in, in the pandemic and, and uh, imposing strict lockdowns only in the hope of saving people's lives. They weren't doing it for any partisan political reason. You thought this was the best science. And as a result of all of that, you were the target of, of you know, bullying by the president, attacks by him, uh, plots uh, to kidnap you, and, or worse. And do you see any possibility out there for lowering the temperature and creating a more positive political discourse? I'm trying. <laughs> you know, um, I have, uh, you know, borne the brunt of a lot of frustration in the midst of a pandemic. It's expected. I knew it was going to be tough when we started to really understand the enormity of the situation and how little information we had. And I fortunately had some great advice from experts here at the University of Michigan advising, you know, each of the efforts that I took to keep people safe. But, you know, I remember calling Vice President Pence and asking him if he could get the White House to turn down the temperature. Um, as soon as I was targeted, we saw, you know, by the president, I, we saw the Republican legislature start, you know, uh, fighting me, start suing me, to starting to try to take away my powers, um, sharing stages with people ultimately who were prosecuted and convicted of plotting to kidnap and kill me. Um, it, was, it was really scary, and I asked everyone, we got to turn on the temperature. Someone's going to get killed. And when you see the attack on Nancy Pelosi's husband, that I mean, this is this is a part of what we've seen happen in recent years in this country. And I, I think your perspective is really helpful because I've been doing this for 20 years. The, so many of the students here are, you know, haven't even been alive, you know, 20 years or just over. And so to have a little perspective that you think that this slide's been happening, but it feels so heavy um, and, and so volatile right now, and, and that's why I think every one of us has to do our part, whether it's uh, office holders like me, people on both sides of the aisle have to, have to take this on. Um, I'm optimistic, though. I still will make seat at the table for anyone who wants to solve a problem. You can call me every name in the book. You know, I prefer Big Gretch, but you can call me. <laughs> call me. <laughs> I don't take any of it personally. You know, I want to solve problems. I want to get things done. And we've had some success doing that. We talk about the bipartisan work that I did the last four years out of absolute necessity. Um, and now that I've got, you know, a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, it is a slim majority, so it's still necessary to try to do as much in a way that brings people to the table and into the conversation. But um, you know, I, I think that we should all be alarmed and concerned by the violent rhetoric, the threats, and, and the actions that people have taken to undermine our democracy, to sow distrust in elections, to um, you know, peddle conspiracy theories. I think that we've seen such a, such a fast proliferation of it in the last few years. Um, I'm grateful that voters largely rejected that across the country in this last election, but I don't by any means think that it's behind us. I think that it continues to be a threat. You know, I know that as an office holder, I have a role and every word I say, people scrutinize and um, might take it out of context or might, um, you know, I said the time for thought for just Thoughts and prayers is over when I was talking about gun violence. And the, that night, an infamous guy on a particular national channel said, I was ridiculing people who pray. That's not what I was doing. I was saying, hey, pray, think, but we got to act too.